The More of Us podcast features real, uncut conversations about life, pastoral ministry, and walking with Jesus. All guests are pastors in the Karis Fellowship, bound by our common commitment to biblical truth, relationship, and mission. We trust as you hear more of us, you'll see Christ among us. Trent, it's been a minute since you and I were in the studio together. How you doing? I'm doing really well. Great to see you today, Tim. You too. I'm looking forward to this conversation with Ben Russell and Matt Wheelock from sunny Sebring, Florida. Before we introduce them, let me just tell you a little bit about their church. They're part of a network of churches, but Neighborhood Church is a multi-generational expression of the body of Christ located in Sebring, Florida, part of a network of neighborhood churches, including Lakeland and Ocala, Florida. Ben and Matt have worked together with one another for more than seven years. I'm guessing that number so they can correct me if I'm wrong where Matt serves as the executive director and Ben as the lead pastor. Guys, welcome. Thanks for being on the podcast today. What's up? And I'll I'll go ahead and correct right away. It's been 10 years, and I am the uh, executive pastor, not director. Oh, did I say executive director? Yeah, I mean, you know. Well, I'll try to call you Matt this whole time. I My sheet said pastor. I just read it director, but whatever. Okay. So thanks for the correction. Tell us, uh, how, how's the weather in Florida today? It's boring today. Yesterday was a little more exciting. We had a near miss of a hurricane um, here in Highlands County anyway. Obviously, north of us got a little bit more excitement than we did. But generally, what it means when a hurricane comes through is the weather cools down, but that did not happen for us. So it is still hot. So where you're located, you had no hurricane damage? Well, we had uh, we had lots of debris from just like leaves and stuff on the roads. Basically, is the extent of the damage. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure somebody somewhere had something come off of a, uh, you know, a building somewhere because we had wind too. But it wasn't wasn't anything that our Florida houses can't handle. Well, praise God for that. Your houses are built Florida tough. That's well. Right. And can you guys identify yourself? Because if if our listeners don't know you, they may not recognize which voice is which. So Ben, you were just telling us about Florida. Tell us your name. Yeah, that's this is Ben. I'm I'm the, the uh, lead pastor here at the church here at Sebring. And um, just to speak to what uh, what Matt already said about our uh, tenure together, it's ten years is definitely the longest or the the length of our work together. But for me as a pastor, it has been seven years. So. You were both right and <laughs> and wrong. And I, you're, so. I thought you were going to say it was the ten longest years of your life working with Matt. Uh, well, that's, that's too. I mean, <laughs> also, all in ten years, years of my adult life. So, and, and I will echo: it's been ten long years. So. <laughs> Guys, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, today, we're going to be discussing some things, talking a few guys again. Um, as I've spent some time with Tim, he's said nothing but, believe it or not, great things about you guys. So I've been anticipating this this conversation. And today, this podcast is going to go out to um, the Karis Fellowship. It's going to be helping a lot of pastors. And so that's our goal and aim today is maybe laugh a little bit, but also have some great insights for our Karis family and pastors. So tell us a little bit about your families. And Matt, you can go first. Yeah, I I can I can go first. A little bit about my family. I've been uh, been married for twenty eight years. We have two boys. They're twenty and twenty three. Um, so we're in this next stage of life of having adult children. <clears throat> are you empty nested, or are you just? Have... I'm halfway empty nested. I still have. We still have one of them still at the house. Uh, our oldest son, actually, he still, he still works here on, around here. So, um, but yeah, it's been uh, been an interesting season of life. We're not, you know, we're not chasing after the uh, sports anymore. Yeah, figuring out what uh, what we're gonna do when we actually are empty. So. All right. How about you, Ben? Yeah, we've been married. Um, me and my wife Meredith have been married for uh, ten years. So. Uh, well, it'll be 10 years in June, so not quite 10 years, but it's coming up real quick. And we have two sons, um, Ezra, who's three, and James, who is going to be one in a few weeks. 
And so just going through like, uh, potty training with the oldest and, um, the, the youngest is trying to figure out how to walk. So we have a lot of like, ex- just exciting, um, mile milestone type things going on in our house, like simultaneously. And so it's, it's a lot of fun. My yeah. wife works. Is that, was that? Oh, good. My wife works as an executive director for, uh, youth for Christ in our County. And so we get to do, um, do ministry together in a lot of ways. So that's been, that's a new thing as of about six months ago. And so it's a little bit about us. Yeah, that's great. I, I enjoy interacting with both of you at conference every year when I get to see you there. And didn't you two do foster care for a little while? Is that correct? Or I'm... we did, we, we had a season of, we weren't actually registered foster parents, but we did what they call non-relative caregiving. And so we had a sibling group in our house, actually two different stints one that was about 13 months, I think. And then the other was about three or four. And so, um, so yeah, we did that back in right. Actually the first, right, right about the time of our first anniversary, I think is when that started. And then, um, so that was kind of our first little, uh, (laughs) journey through the parenting thing, but yeah, obviously different with two elementary age kids and, um, and then later three elementary age kids. Yeah. Yeah, it is fun to watch those milestones and they pile up at the beginning and then they start to get stretched out. I have a daughter who's about to graduate this year, so that's a major milestone for us. Yeah. I've got one that got married last year, Tim. You and I don't look that old. Yeah. We I, really don't. Some days I feel that old, but... <laughs> well, true. We Yeah. Yeah. But we don't look that old, though. No, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, introvert, extrovert scale. I'm curious, uh, Ben, Matt, where do you line up? Well, I'm definitely, um, definitely an introvert that has to put on extroverted tendencies. Um, I got introvert from a big family. So like, I, I don't, I struggle to be, uh, I'm used to being around people, but people, people exhaust me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that's me. It's a good question for Matt though. Well, I am an extrovert who puts up with a lot of introverts. <laughs> Um, married to an introvert. So that, you know, that, that has certainly come with its challenges because I'm just like, people excite me, you know, and that's the thing that like, uh, makes me excited about the day. Just be able to be, you know, spend time with people and all that. And then, you know, so when, if we're, <laughs> if I'm engaging that full tilt, she's miserable. No, she's not miserable, but she's learned, she's had to learn how to uh, keep up a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> it's been interesting. For sure. It's what makes, yeah. And then dealing with Ben, he is definitely introverted. Well, a lot of pastors seem to be introverted. Is that your experience too, Trent? You're nodding your head over there. Absolutely. You know, I, in my study of, of pastors, I'll find out that some some guys that I thought, you know, they were just the natural extrovert, and we sit down and talk to them, and the, I'm talking successful pastors, they're introverts. Yeah. I, I mean, it was an amazing study, but it's absolutely true. Um, Tim, how about you? Are you an introvert or extrovert? I'm I'm an introvert for sure, but I can push the button. I just know by the end of Sunday mornings, like I love the preaching aspect. I like to mingle a little bit, but the small talk wipes me out. I, I'm an introvert, absolutely. And I can remember my years of pastoring that my wife would say, I would be forced to be an extrovert and I could do it well. But my natural inclination is keep me in my office, lock the door. I don't want to talk to anybody. I think my love language is leave me alone. <laughs> Well, I know uh, one of the things that makes Matt Wheelock fun to be with is his extroverted nature. And if you ever get a chance to golf with him, it, it's it's totally worth it. So he yeah. he keeps a he keeps the foursome on the golf course a very interesting experience. I I can tell you that. Yeah, and I've uh, I've learned how to watch my uh, language on the golf course. Too. <laughs> Maybe someday you'll figure out how to hit the ball straight. That'll be even better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey guys, got a question for you. Um, not including work with your church, how are you guys involved in your communities? Well, I currently uh, just took a uh, took a role with um, our local county fire rescue as the chaplain. Um, so that's been an interesting uh, uh, beginning of something that's that's fairly new in my life. Um, but yeah, it's being able to be able to connect with people that are uh, working hard. <clears throat> In our community, for sure. How did you get interested in that? <laughs> I was so one of the the uh, 
chiefs in uh, in our county it goes to our church. Uh, so just I've gotten to know him over the years, and uh, it got to the surface that it was a need in our community. It doesn't it actually the there is no chaplain program in our community for uh, fire rescue, and so he approached me after a couple of major events happened uh, around us, and uh, I asked if I would be interested, and I immediately was <laughs> was not really for it. I'm like, eh, I don't really have the space for that. Uh, but then he approached me probably two months later and uh, just felt like it was it was the right thing to uh, to engage. Uh, and it's 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 been it, it just over the last couple of months, it, uh, like the need uh, is very apparent as I've visited some of the firehouses. What a truly neat way to serve your community, my friend. Yeah, it has been it's been good. It's been good. What about yeah, you, for friend? me, uh, yeah, like official capacity right now is to serve on what's called the Children's Services Council, which is an advisory uh, board, I, th I think is what we're called, for our county uh, commissioners. And so basically it's uh, it's a week, it's a monthly meeting uh, where we talk about, you kind of hear reports from local school board, we hear um child welfare stuff, um, uh, public health stuff. And basically the idea is that we're to sort of help the, um, the board of County commissioners be aware of things related to families, things related to kids and how they can potentially shift policy and things like that, um, to help those things out, just kind of be a ear to the ground, um, on those things. And so. I got involved with that sort of through what we already talked about with our our engagement as uh, a pastor's family within our local child welfare stuff through fostering. Um, and so just got a lot of connections through that. And um, and somebody asked me to join this council, which I didn't really even know existed. I don't think most people in our county know exists, but just kind of a behind the scenes way um, for me to stay abreast of what's going on and and kids and families in our community and, and to do a little bit of uh, public service. And so, but that's, that's the, kind of the most, as far as an official capacity for me. And then obviously just my, my wife is very active in um, mom uh, Facebook groups and things like that, trying to stay uh, engaged with what's going on with young families in our community that were uh, people think of Sebring in central Florida primarily as a retirement community, which, um, is obviously our biggest group of of residents, but um, we have a growing growing uh, population of young young families. And there's an old joke about Florida being the home of the newlywed and the nearly dead, and that's pretty much accurate. Yeah. So, and so, anyways, just trying to stay um, connected and build relationships with people who are got young family young families with young kids, and which can be a tough season of life for folks, especially here in Florida, where. Uh, generally speaking, you see a lot of people who have moved here from sort of a somewhere up north or somewhere else, and they're disconnected from their families. And so just try to be adoptive uh, kind of community for them. And, and obviously it presents some opportunities to to be a witness as well. So That's good. Yeah, we need those, those sort of outlets in public service as pastors just to stay connected to the community and understand them better. This would be the last question in this first category. I was just understanding you guys, your life a little bit, but uh, describe one hobby, tradition, or habit that you would say makes your life richer. Makes my life richer. Yeah. Better. Awesome. Yeah. Blessed. Choose a synonym. Well, uh, yeah. Or, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy golfing. Don't do it nearly as much. I don't know if it makes my life richer, though. Um. <laughs> <laughs> in this in this season of life, one of the new you know quote unquote traditions uh, that my wife and I do is every Thursday we uh, we spend time with both of our our sons and their uh, their prospective girlfriends uh, just to continue you know to, to you know, be engaged with their life, knowing that um, it, it'll be just around the corner where we won't be able to do that as often. Uh, and so that's been a, that has made my life richer to be able to spend good good quality time with uh, with them, getting to know uh, 
more about their life and, uh, and continue to engage that relationship. Hmm. For you, Ben, I'm as I'm hesitant to give my answer just because there's a there's a, a stereotype about people who are in this group that, that like to talk about this. Um, but for me, I think uh, over the last year it's been uh, CrossFit. So my wife and I belong to a CrossFit gym and something that I just got into in the last year, and it's been a really good outlet for me physically, um, but also just to have a community around um, around that. And so if you know anything about CrossFit and CrossFitters, it's a sort of like a fitness cult that you belong to, right? <laughs> so, um, but it's been it's been a really I would say it's been a rich and a richening experience for sure. So do you go out and do flip tractor tires? Yeah, yeah. Basically, I, it was, the funny thing is, at the front of our gym, there's two tractor tires, and I've never touched them once. So it's there uh, to keep up the the image, basically. Um. <laughs> Good for you, my friend. Good for you, my friend. Um, I've got several people that do that, and they they seem to enjoy it. Um, I'm kind of an old fashioned weightlifting, so I'm I'm looking at it. My son's starting to do it a little bit, so it's probably something I'm going to try out as well. So good for you. If you just add a little bit conditioning of uh, conditioning gear weightlifting, and you're doing CrossFit. So yeah, absolutely. Go. Hey, we're going to transition now to more ministry related questions, and the first question um, that I have for you, and I'm kind of interested in this because I love hearing pastor stories, is neither of you followed a traditional path into pastoral ministry. Tell us about your guys' call to ministry. Well, first off, what is a traditional path? I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> like, describe, describe to me the traditional path. Well, I, I'd like to take a stab at what he, what it must be. It must be going to Grace Theological Seminary. Well, well amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> you, we are here on the campus of Grace Theological Seminary talking with the Director of the Center for Thriving Leaders, so that's part of it, yeah. Absolutely. In my world, that's not traditional. But, you know, I'll, uh, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. So I, when do I need to get enrolled at uh, First Theological Seminary? Well, we've already got the paper sent to you, so we're just waiting for you to respond. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Send a check with it, too. <laughs> Um, so my, my initial call started in, uh, early twenties and I had been a believer for a number of years, you know, probably a, a decade or so, but really never, never engaged with that, um, meant, so, you know, as far as the, uh, the action, the active part of it. So. Yeah, early twenties. It was right when we, uh, we we were expecting our first child. Is when I really started engaging that calling in my life, and it was the, it was the typical. You know, you're going to a church, or you start going to a church, and you're like, I want to really, follow, really follow Jesus now. And then that pastor goes, Yeah, we're looking for somebody to help out in children's ministry. Let's get you plugged in there. Yeah, two weeks into a, <laughs> a recommittal of my life, and. That was sort of the the, the beginning, and then a couple of years after that, I, we were going to another church, and just really felt this prompting of getting involved in uh, in ministry there. And <laughs> I, we I met with the pastor there, and he plugged me up with somebody who uh, was not a graduate of of Grace Theological Seminary, but he was a graduate a graduate of uh, Liberty University. Uh, and he was. Are we allowed to say favorite. that on this podcast, Tim? <laughs> that we keep we do have editing capabilities, so yeah. <laughs> uh, and he and he was, he was the typical Liberty grad, uh, Baptist dude, you know, high 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 above the ear haircut, you know. And he, <laughs> and when he met me for the first time, I was a guy with baggy shorts. I had gold hoop earrings and tattoos he's like what am i supposed to do with this guy uh but he he and his wife uh, larry and mary Stu, were just absolutely shapeable in like accepting and and pouring into uh and that really just that stirred something into me to to uh to seek after pastoral um 
uh, the the pastoral calling and the uh, yeah, and then that just just continued to snowball from there all the way down to you know meeting uh, the Reverend Doctor Randall Smith and just continuing to to pour into me um, and and to be able to uh, go through the whole ordination process. So yeah, there's a rough necky and young buck who loved who loved his rap music. Uh, <laughs> did not go to seminary. I did end up going to Southeastern University and got a degree in church leadership. But that was because Randy Smith, he made me. Basically. Oh. <laughs> but, and it's been, let's see, 12, let's say 20. Yeah, about 25 years. Wow. That's my tradition. Thank you. Hey, Ben, how about you? Yeah, that's your non traditional path. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that, um, so I grew grew up in a Grace Brethren Church in Martinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, super, um, just a really a really great church to belong to, um, especially as a as a child and as a youth student. Um, they said uh, they were a church always and continues to pour into the next generation really really well. And so through that, going to church camp, going to a Momentum Youth Conference, I went to the first. Um, conference after it was called the NYC. Uh, and there kind of got recruited as we do such a good job at Momentum uh, recruiting for Operation Barnabas. And say that um, I ended up on Operation Barnabas, and I remember Ed Lewis making uh, the sale, so to speak, right? Through the landing out saying, are, are you called to full time vocational ministry? And, I really felt the spirit laying that call up and part at that, at that point as 15 years old. And so I came home to Operation Barnabas and got involved with, um, as an intern under uh, my pastor, who was Adam Johnson. And uh, he really took me under his wing and I kind of got a crash course in what being a each pastor, what, what being a pastor looked like. And, uh, but at that point I was, I was, um, super hesitant about the idea of pastoral ministry. I knew I was called to vocational ministry, but I um, was really interested in worship. And so I've been involved in uh, worship staff at, at MGC and played drums and played guitar. And so that was sort of my trajectory was I was going to go be a worship pastor, worship leader. And um, came to Seabrook as a 17-year-old, um, went to Great Commission Bible Institute, and there, um, that was where the Lord sort of gave me my first opportunity to, to teach um, at the church in Ocala at a Sunday school uh, hour before the service in um, sort of March of 2012. And um, I remember getting back from that trip um, and thinking, man, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hate that, which was a funny thing to say, but the, re- the reason why I said that was because I was the kind of guy you would have never enjoyed any kind of public speaking um, in front of people, that kind of thing, right? I could do it if it was related to music, but I couldn't do it if it was speaking. And so I could tell that the Holy Spirit was doing something. And so um, just through a process of the our church on Seabrill mentoring me, different leaders, and um, just continuing to grow in that, like received that call of pastoral ministry sort of um, up through the the years of an intern year and then later on staff. So so that was my path. Yeah, that actually sounds somewhat traditional in the sense that you have from youth yeah. group this call, you go to a conference, a uh, yeah. youth pastor pouring into you. And uh, I what's non-traditional maybe is how quickly you got involved in your church ministry. Like you were fairly young yeah. when you started and Matt was a little bit older when he started and I'm just yeah. defending my question here, so I'll I'll oh, give it back yeah. to Trent. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it, it reminds me of like what Eric Miller was talking about at conference about starting your freshman, right? About yeah. starting, not not wanting to. We need if we're gonna pray that the next generation, we need to um, entrust leadership and entrust tasks and pour into people before we think they're ready, um, because that's how we get ready. All right, so. I, 
The second part of that question, um, you, you kind of answered it a little bit. But along the way, how have some key people helped your spiritual development, and then how have they helped you? You kind of answered that a little bit. You mentioned some names along the way, but um, who are some key people that really helped you in your spiritual development? Um, well, like I mentioned, Larry uh, Larry Mark was one of those people, and, and Randy Smith uh, for sure. I remember being at a church before I came to what is now neighborhood church. And I was, you know, I was on the path of getting into pastoral leadership, or at least talking about it. And I was going to, um, I, I, I needed to start, start working on the ordination, you know, exam. And I remember I'm like, I'm really struggling because the, the pastor had sent me what the exam looked like. And I remember go, looking at us over going, man, I I really don't know any of this stuff. And so I, I voiced my concern to him. He goes, that's fine. I'll just give you all the answers. Like, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> within within a couple of months, I, I found myself at, at Neighborhood Church with, with Randy Smith. And uh, he... he uh, Larry did a lot of, as far as the developing and, and seeing the call and knowing what it, what it meant to be like uh, a mature husband and ministry leader, but he didn't, he didn't move to that step of the biblical knowledge. And then Randy sort of <laughs> it's, uh, like, uh, I, it got me excited about it and, uh, and, and really developed the, the, the learning aspect of learning doctrine, learning scripture, and having a, a better understanding of God's word, uh, which has helped shape uh, my uh, my my decision making skills for in a lot of areas. Uh, so yeah, two different two different aspects of the spiritual development, uh, and it's been both of both of are definitely needed. But that, yeah, for me, it's um, I'll just restrict my comments to my neighborhood experience for sake of just time. I mean, I already talked about Pastor Adam, but for me, you know, there's an obvious influence of Pastor Randy as the professor of GCBI and the lead teacher, lead teaching pastor here um, through the early years of me being here. Um, but as far as relationally, like people engaging um, me you know, from a mentoring or discipleship perspective, it was two people. It was first of all, Aaron Michelle, um, who was only here for like first two years of my time at Sebring, but um, it was just really uh, pivotal. He actually, um, him and his wife invited me to live with them for the last year of them living here in Sebring. And so um, just some real like life on life discipleship stuff happened during that, that year. And um, and so their hospitality, generosity through that um, just hugely shaping. And then also Matt, who... Um, he really kind of filled in that role once Aaron uh, moved on. He, he moved on, took a pastoral role in Spokane, Washington. And so Matt um, never invited me to live with him. He had two kids um, already, so there wasn't any space. And besides, uh, at that point, I was getting married, so I didn't want to live with anybody anyway, except for my wife. But um, we, uh, Matt, we used to do a thing uh, on Monday nights. He'd have a lot of us young leaders from in the church over to his house just to have dinner. And um, as a young person, that was huge because you're broke and you don't have, uh, you're not a good cook yet. And so uh, we got to go and grow up uh, at Matt's place and, and just talk ministry and talk life. And um, that was just a, for about, I don't know, it was probably five or six years, the first five or six years of our time here. It was just a, a life giving thing for our team. And um, it just set, set just that, again, that example of like just doing life together hospitality, um, transparency, you know, this is, this is who I am, where I live, how we live. And I think that's all just as important as the doctrinal and professional side of things. So it's interesting when you look over the qualifications for an elder, one of those words that we can easily skip over is hospitable, such a powerful, yeah. powerful virtue when you practice it. Are you a better cook now, Ben? I mean that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that, so, I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, my mom was a fantastic cook, um, but um, I think I, I did pick up a lot of things uh, from Matt, too. And so, um, especially the heavy use of black pepper, and um, and that's 
and butter. Right? Those are really the two. Oh, yeah. Two and that butter. Can't go wrong with butter. That's for sure. Well, tell me a little bit about Neighborhood Church. I'd love to hear about the culture of Neighborhood Church. How would you describe it? Well, we put, we put in our... Um, our little summary on the website, which, you know, you quoted from a, a multi-generational expression of the, the body of Christ. I think multi-generational is one of the main, sort of one of our main things. It's not like one of our values. It's just kind of part of uh, who we are. Uh, we live in a retirement community, uh, one of the older zip codes, I think, in the country um, by BDN8. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of retired folks, which brings with it a lot of really rich things. Um, you know, mature believers, uh, a lot of wisdom. Um, and so, but we've also got uh, sort of unique to a lot of the churches. If you come in, just kind of take a tour of churches around Highlands County. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of gray heads, and there's a there's a lot of retirement age folks. And it's hard to find a church that has family sometimes in our community. Um, which I think is more of a thing across the board nowadays, to be honest. But um, so we we're we're just grateful, really, that the Lord blessed us with um, that multi generational reality. You know, which is something that you can't really manufacture. It's just something the Lord blesses you with, and so we think that's important for a church or important for discipleship. I think other than that, I think just trying to be friendly in a hospitable environment is a big part of why um, neighborhood became our name when we did the, the rebrand. And so, um, it was also based on scripture stuff, but, um, that neighborly, uh, friendly environment, hospitable environments, something that we are, we're really passionate about. And of course, in addition to scripture. So. I mean, maybe we just go straight to that rebrand rebrand question that we asked too, because you, uh, you did change your name a couple of years ago. You've also gone through a leadership transition. So, We'd love for you to speak into those two things. What did you learn from the rebranding experience? Tell us a little bit why you did it. And then what have you learned from the uh, succeeding Randy and the leadership transition? Yeah, well, I'll let Matt talk about the name change since <laughs> since I already I skipped him on the last question. <laughs> no, you can you can skip me that time. When, when you they asked about the, uh, the culture at neighborhood church, I'm like, well, I go to three neighborhood churches. Uh, and we are all uh, multi generational, but there's a lot of differences in, in the cultures. So, yeah, but it, they're all exciting. Uh, succession. Uh, well, you should start with rebrand. I mean, I feel like to like start with was... the rebrand. Yeah. Well, the, the rebrands started um, for the most part because we work with two other churches. Um, they are both in. We all, one of the things that was unique is that uh, the the name Grace uh, was in a number of churches in their towns, uh, and we have one of uh, we have another Grace that's we actually had at one point three Graces three Grace churches of some sort on on our road, uh, so that was one of the beginning things. But it all started in Ocala because they were going through a whole rebranding. Uh, pretty much starting from the ground up. And you know, so they had started to move that way. And so that just got us all thinking, hey, let's just do this together. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of benefits to that. <clears throat> and so uh, the, 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 the reasons for it certainly were rooted in, in Scripture and to, to be able to tell a story uh, and, and, and really speak to the mission of our church which is inviting our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus. And so when you use that, the, the words neighbor or neighborhoods, like there's just a, there's just a richness that's rooted in scripture. Um, it didn't come without its challenges. That's for sure. Uh, some, some people just outright didn't like it. This is this, the, the, the biggest one that we faced was, well, my church, this church isn't in my neighborhood. And I'm like, well, let me correct you because you are the church and you live in your neighborhood and you go to this this body, you belong to this body. So it's like just trying to use as a teaching opportunity to too, go everybody that attends here is in in their own neighborhood reflecting Christ. So, so yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think it's been it's long term, it's been good. We've been at this for about what 19, 20 months uh, into the name change. Uh, and I think that we've only 
in all three in all three uh, locations have seen it uh, be for the best. Yeah, we love the word grace. Obviously, Grace Brethren, Grace College, it's all mm-hmm. Caris Fellowship, it's all all grace. So uh, yeah. it was never about let's distance ourselves. And that was one of the things that we had to clarify with folks. It's like, we're not going anywhere with the fellowship. This isn't uh, to move away from any of that. This is just to try and, it's really about our communities and helping um, to distinguish one church from the next, not because uh, just for clarity's sake, we'd have folks come into our church building looking for a funeral that was at a different church, right? And so when when you have folks who can't can't tell which building they're supposed to show up to for a funeral or or a, a service, it's just a disservice to our community. And also, um, so anyway, it, that was really our heart behind it. In addition to trying to capitalize on those vision pieces, and so was the yeah, well inviting our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus and you know, the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, so yeah, it, it came with challenges, but we're really glad that we did it. And and when you talk about the secession or is that the right, I think that right? Succession plan. Succession? Not to secede. Hey, as in- hey wait, let, 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 me, let me cut in just for a second before you start with succession plan. The one thing that we learned about it is that do it right on the cusp of a worldwide pandemic and work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it, yeah. That that was part it, of the strategic plan, people. right? Right. <laughs> it, it just gaslight people and say, what do you mean? It's always been neighborhood church. Yeah. You know? <laughs> For the record, we do not advocate gaslighting on the More of oh, Us podcast. Uh, <laughs> and, and you guys... No gaslighting. Gaslight. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so Matt, what Matt just said is like huge for that whole conversation is in reality we, we've been through is a, the whole country, the whole world has been through a season of change over the last you know, three, five years. And so all of these things, the name change, the leadership transition, um, all happened within two years of the pandemic. And so it's just been a, it's been an elongated season of change and, um, and it's come with a lot of challenges. Obviously, everybody knows that, right? Turnover in churches is across the, across the board, and it's and it's really hard as a leader to to be missing people um, that were you were close to, you know. And we've walked through that for sure. Um, as far as the 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 leadership transition, I would say that was probably one of the easier parts of that whole conversation. Uh, Simply because you know the elders and Pastor Randy just did such a phenomenal job of planning ahead for that. Yeah, and so that was a conversation where the church family was let know a year ahead of time, and the elders were having conversations two years ahead of time um, about what was going to occur and about Pastor Randy um, moving on and about about me taking taking um, taking over. And the other thing that's a big part of that is goes back to the to the sort of my my path or whatever ministry conversation which is that um i'd really been handed a lot of responsibilities especially in the in the jeopardy department of things um but even in the teaching side of things i was already a familiar face to everybody in the church um they they, they knew how i preached they knew uh, my heart and i knew them and so it was uh it was just it was a very that part of it was a seamless transition, you know, uh, certainly came with numbers changing around. Like you, you saw people leave the church, right. And that's the reality of any transition oftentimes, sadly. Um, but, uh, but all in all, like the Lord did his part to, to continue to bless and to guide our, our congregation brought new faces. And, um, and so anyway, yeah, but I really attribute a lot of that to the wisdom of the spirit, like through Randy, through Matt, through the elders, and say, hey, we need to do this transition over the long haul so that it's not a surprise. And actually that the clear communication ahead of time is always a good, like is always the better plan than the sneak attack approach, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Well, one of the things that we're doing here at Grace College and Seminary is we're developing some new programs um, that help guide, direct, bring insights to different church modalities. And so I, I'm curious, 
Um, what are some of the benefits and challenges that you have seen working with other campuses? <laughs> um, challenges, the challenges is, is working together. Uh, and we all, we all probably know exactly what that means. Um, when we first started working together as three churches with, um, with three or four different pastors, um, one of the things that Pastor Mike said in in uh, in Ocala was that when we're when we're sharing ideas, there's going to be a lot of good ideas left on the table. Um, and getting over the uh, the pride side to say, all right, well, this was my great idea, and we're going to do this thing, uh, and knowing that it might not have been the best. Um, so working working through that has has been interesting. We have I I, I do believe that we have been able to shape each other because we are so uh, unique and uniquely gifted uh, each one of the each one of the guys that we work with so um, yeah so that's that's uh, the, the the benefits is that it, it just goes in a, from my standpoint that we're just we're stronger together uh, and we can we're, we're not on an island we, we meet together on a very regular basis uh, and we converse throughout the week via you know text threads and everything else. And so we, we just are in constant communication with each other, which I think finds its, finds its incredible value there. Do you do any sermon prep together? Do you have shared elders among your churches? What does that look like? Yeah. So we, um, we are, we share a preaching calendar every year. We take a preaching retreat and we plan, you know, what we're going to do for the next year. And honestly, it's more like the next two years usually and we often, um, so, so yeah, we're, we're preaching our, our preaching calendar is shared. There's freedom, right. To, to shift things along the way for the individual campuses, but in general, we're preaching from the same calendar. Um, we have, um, you know, the, the elders conversation is, you know, one that's sort of on general, we have one of the big goals for, so both Lakeland and Ocala, uh, have been revitalization projects, um, and we partnered with Assist on those recently, and so um, one of the big goals in both of those places is is the local elders, right? And so um, right now, like the, historically, the elders at Sebring have been, you know, sort of the elders for all three all three churches. Um, but like the thing we're continuing to push into is um, is how to how to get those local elders for those yeah. congregations, which really believe are, is is important and is the long term goal. And so we're seeing growth in that both uh, in both Lakeland and Ocala. And so, yeah. Real quick too. Yeah. There's a lot of efficiency that, that can come with it, but also inefficiency because relationships are not, are inherently inefficient, right? <laughs> oh people, yeah. People, people create uh, challenges, but people are the ministry. So, you know, and that's on a leadership level, like I'm the problem, right? Most of the time, right? at least for Matt and so, and vice versa. Matt's the problem. And so no, we, I'm just joking. But, well, no, to speak to but you know how it is. It's yeah. The more people you've got in the room, like the more challenging it can be, but that's the point, you know? And so that's one of the things that, that we like about where the Lord is, has placed us. Yeah. I would like you to speak to your relational dynamic between you, Ben, as lead pastor and Matt as the executive pastor. Uh, what's that look like? How do you guys keep healthy relationship? <laughs> uh, how do we keep a healthy relationship? Maybe you don't. I don't talking, know. Talking. Yeah. Maybe we don't have it. Talking, talking things out. Uh, it, you know, the thing is, he he and I's role is is so different. Um, and so you know, it just it comes in. Uh, yeah, it comes with a little extra. Sometimes, sometimes I'm not exactly uh, in sync, and neither is he. And but uh, meeting together on a regular basis, talking things out, uh, seeing each other's point of view. <laughs> yeah, the the the, you know, the quote unquote executive side, the business side, and the uh, the pastoral shepherding side. We both have to do a little bit of both. Yeah, or no, one of the we have to do a lot of one and a little bit of the other. You know, and it's. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I, I, I always tell people that, that Matt's, Matt is a father figure, right, for me, and that um, he's somebody that I uh, that I look up to, and so that makes um, it's it, it, so the dynamic is funny because you know for years you know, it was just like crystal clear that, um, that, that he was, he was the Paul and I was the Timothy, but you know, the, the whole idea with discipleship is that eventually, you know, Timothy, um, grows up, you know, and there's a, and so the transition for us in the last few years, I think has been how to, how do I, how do we relate to each other as peers? How does he, um, Matt's, Matt's role in my life is the, the one who talks me off of, uh, the pastoral emotional ledge all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Not to say, to say like, hey, it's okay. This is this is the job. Like, um, to say this is uh, this is tough stuff, and and this is how we handle it, and to be that anchor and that reminder all the time. And he, Matt's probably biggest strength in in ministry is that he has a heart that's way bigger than I think most people realize because he's got a. He's got a real up for like a combination of like that. He's kind of like the mullet of ministry. It's business up front, party in the back, right? And so, um, and so he's known for like being the jovial, fun, like guy that you want to hang out with at conference and play golf with. But he's also he's also got you know a, a really uh, powerful presence. And so people get the idea that Matt's not got a big heart, but he does. The thing that makes that such a powerful thing for ministry and for me as a pastor to have a pastor to me is that he uh, he does love people, but he doesn't wear his emotions the same way some some pastors, shepherd let it, let people like me are sort of like, like wear their emotions on their sleeves and get really challenged by some of the tar- you know, tough things that you, you see in ministry. That's why he does what he does with the the fire department, um, which is a new opportunity for him, but like he's used to those crises and can speak into leaders who are struggling through crises, which is kind of what leadership is like one, one thing after another. So I think I'm going to write a new book. It's going to be called the new leadership style, the mullet of ministry, <laughs> business up front and party in the back. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I want to live that one down. I'm going to make, I don't have my wife design your t-shirt, man. Yeah, you got, there you go. <laughs> and the irony is that he's bald. I know that is that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. But he's wearing a hat too. So I, yeah, the, what you just said there, just describing that relationship that you have for every pastor to have that kind of relationship, where there's someone else in their life who is uh, a mentor and then a friend, someone who talks you off the ledge, someone who helps you know that this is just the way it is. It's tough, but I'm gonna love with you. Uh, man, yeah. we we would all be successful in ministry if we had other people like that. So I I loved that you shared that. But and one of the one of the things on my from my standpoint is it's the the ability or, or yeah the ability to to be shaped by by Ben as well. Like to have that that kind of a perspective. Like he has he and I have had conversations where he's kicked me in my mouth. Like. Hi, when you said this, when you did this, this was this wasn't necessarily the best thing, uh, the best reflection. It's like you know what? You're right. <laughs> you're you're right. Uh, and I'm just seeing too many of the you know the older guy, the younger guy relationship. It's like the older guy just couldn't be shaped by the younger guy because you know he's just older, and that that's not always easy. But uh, it is something that I have. Um, gleaning from and been shaped by. So I appreciate that. I do think that discipleship and mentorship often goes both ways. It's not just top down, but if it's a real relationship, we're both learning things from uh, the relationship. And uh, this does take us to the last part of our conversation with you two is at the end of the day, we are all men in process following Jesus, pastors of the Karis Fellowship, and we want to grow to become more like Jesus. And Someday we may lose the pastor title or we may step out of that role, but we're still following Jesus. And so we want to ask you some questions along those lines. Just what, what is it with your Bible reading that you do that keeps it from becoming rote, academic, or maybe even just limited to like sermon prep or a devotional that you have to give? What do you do to keep your Bible reading fresh? I'm I, for, for me personally, it is, I don't do a whole lot of sermon prep. 
uh, at this stage of my uh, minister, my pastoral ministry. Uh, I, I do some, but not, you know, not a, certainly not a weekly thing. And so um, I, I feel like I, the, the thing that drives me is uh, reading ahead, right? Because we are, you know, 18 to 24 months out as far as our planning, I know where we're going as a, as a church body uh, and just trying to, 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 to read ahead of where, we, where we're going to be uh, so as to be challenged before we get there. Uh, cause I think that that's the, 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 the guy who preaches or the pastor that preaches every week is being challenged to the week with the, with, with the thing that he's going to be preaching on Sunday. And I don't have that. And so, uh, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm probably two months ahead of where we're going to be, but being challenged by a, a sermon, our next sermon series, reading through Hebrews okay. and just, just sort of staying ahead of it has just, you know, it gives me a regular rhythm. Uh, and, and I've just, uh, I'm a, I'm a, you know, not necessarily, I am a scheduled guy, but, uh, you know, I, I'm an outline guy. So I just like, what's, what's coming up. I need, I, I need it just to be, uh, cut and dry, not just open up things and figure out where the Holy Spirit leads me. Well, it's, he's already leading. So. Yeah. I think for me, it's, it's, um, other preachers, um, some of them in my community who I could sit down and have conversations with, uh, give me a good book recommendation. A lot of it is just the podcasts of other, other pastors, other churches, um, just listening to be fed. Right. And, and that obviously continues in the scriptures on, you know, on a personal devotional level too, but also just reading, you know, reading books on uh, devotional stuff and um books on prayer has been a big theme for me over the last few years is i'm like we're just from uh i think our fellowship in general is a is a you know truth driven and and word driven fellowship and so like of the spirit of disciplines i think they do perhaps struggle the most with i do i know it's prayer and so um just getting some good input from different um different folks on that and so yeah that's for me and also just conversations with folks in my church. Uh, it's like there are a number of young, younger men in the faith and just their questions always, you know, keep you, keep you digging. Right. Um, not just for the, on the personal devotional side, but on the outside of the, the sermon prep side of like, oh yeah, I need to, you know, to grow in this too. Cause they're, I, they got questions that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> so. I do think spiritual growth is this blend between our personal practices and then also corporate practices or learning from other people. And so the things that you share, like these conversations with other people, other people's sermons, but then there is time just, just praying and that nourishes my walk with Jesus. I do want to close out with this question here. Um, what's something that both of you, so each one of you individually need to hear from Jesus at this, at this phase in your life and ministry? Uh, uh, the thing that I consistently need to hear from Jesus is I've got you. Uh, and I, I, yeah, there's, it's that, it's that, uh, it's that circus trick where you have all these plates spinning <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, you get to the point where they're just wobbling. It's like, something's going to, something's going to break, you know, uh, and just, being able to rely on him and trusting him that he's got, he's got this and, and just like, uh, work, he, he's working the plan. I just get to be a part of it. And mm. so you bet. Yeah. For me, I think it's that, it's that audience of one principle. I think that, uh, I am, uh, uh, we talk about being an introvert, but I'm also, uh, uh, just, a by nature, a people pleaser. Right, a pe uh, peacemaker is like the positive spin on that. I think it all comes from being the oldest and 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 a big family, and um, and so, anyways, that just people pleasing mentality is is exhausting, right? And so, it's recognizing that in ministry, I don't I do serve the our congregation, but I ultimately serve serve Him, right? And so, He's the one that min I'm a minister to. And the, to the folks in our church and our team and all those, like I, I do serve them, but it's it's like it's not about their opinions, right? It's not about me, even my opinion about myself. Um, 
it's simply about that getting down back back to the one right yeah. who is one that um, hopefully it should be the reason we're we're even in all this and so and because of what he did for us on the cross and so we're doing we're doing revelation 12 verse tw- uh, no five verse 12 this week worthy is the lamp right to receive what's it what is he worthy of well it's a long rest there's seven things here it in okay and sebring.com you can check it out <laughs> hey this just became a commercial at the end there yeah well i you know we couldn't earlier for drace and i figured you could do it for our, uh our sermon podcast there you so, go I'm just... well let me tell you this here at the end matt jesus has it he's got it for you and uh he carries the plates and ben jesus sees you and he gives you what you need to work and will for his good pleasure. We're glad you guys could join us today for the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. Rich material today, and I hope our listeners take advantage and lock in, listen to this material, listen to these seasoned pastors, their life experiences, still counting on Jesus, believing Jesus to keep the, the plate spinning, that none of them fall And as long as he is in charge, we're going to be okay. Guys, thank you so much for being with us today from Florida. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. This is Dr. Trent Lambert from the Center for Thriving Leaders at Grace Theological Seminary and Pastor Tim Sprankle from Leesburg Grace Church. Thanks for listening to our conversation with Ben Russell and Matt Wheelock. More of Us podcast recognizes that we are not alone. We lead best when we walk with others. Join us for more of these talks by subscribing today. And God bless.